Amen. Amen. What a great, important, much needed reminder for this morning. Good morning, everybody. My name is Lisa Rodriguez Watson. Um, I have the privilege of being one of the pastors here at Christ City Church. Welcome. Welcome here in Minor. Welcome on YouTube. Welcome on the podcast. I feel like maybe we as pastors forget to say that from time to time because sometimes people listen to the sermon after the fact. So if you're listening on the podcast, hi. Thanks for joining. Um, I'm so glad that you're here. Um, I'm eager for how God will meet us today, um, wherever we are, whether we're in the room, whether we're out in virtual land, um, whenever it is that you hear this message, I am eager for how God will meet you. So we, um, we're continuing in our sermon series called How to Really Live. We're in the final section of Mark, and we began um, the series back here at the beginning of January. Um, we've been taking a look through the last section of the book of Mark with a particular focus on what Jesus' last season of life can teach us about what it means to really live. Not just survive or get by, um, but in the everyday world where we navigate holding the tensions of joy and pain, of hardship and blessing, contentment and discontentment, questions, with no answers and answers with no meaning. In the midst of all of these things, Jesus invites us into life, really, really living. And he shows us, he embodies for us, not just tells us, he shows us how to do it. So as we get into the passage today, um, it's helpful to have a reminder of context. <laughs> when we were in our, in our meeting ahead of the service, someone said, so you're going to be preaching about taxes today. I was like, yes, it's going to be about taxes. <laughs> it's not. Um, <laughs> Jesus is in Jerusalem a few weeks ago when we began the series, Matthew preached on what we've known in the church as the triumphal entry. He's making his way into Jerusalem. It's the capital city, and folks everywhere are so excited. He comes in riding on the back of a donkey. They're waving palm branches, throwing their cloaks on the ground as he's riding in front of them, saying, shouting in a loud voice, Hosanna, Hosanna, which means save us. And that is precisely what he intends to do, but he is going to do it in his own way, on his own time, in his own time, to fulfill the will of the Father and to usher in a new way of being God's people. The religious leaders are seriously threatened by Jesus and have plotted to find a way to arrest him. You'll remember when Drea preached, she, she preached about how Jesus overturned the tables in the temple courts, disrupted the economic systems there because they were exploiting the poor rather than allowing the temple to be a place of inclusion and worship for all people. So in this chapter, the chief priests have sent a group of religious and political leaders to test Jesus and set a trap for him. And it's a doozy. <laughs> He's in the midst of a Jewish crowd who know that they are the people of God and who understand their allegiance to be to God and none other. Meanwhile, they're also under Roman occupation and they are subjects of the Roman Empire, which deals very quickly with insurrection and treason. The scene is set for the showdown. The chief priests are convinced they finally have a way to trap Jesus. They'll get him either on political terms as a revolutionary and Rome will deal with him, or they'll get him on religious terms and have him discredited for unfaithfulness to Jewish law and faith. One of the things that I love about Jesus is he is the master question asker. Don't, do you love it when like people ask you a good question? <laughs> a good question, just what a... Uh, what a great experience. Um, he is not given to anxiety or overwhelm. He tells stories and he asks questions that prompt deeper thinking and examination rather than simply offering clear-cut answers. He's always inviting into deeper relationship rather than delivering formulas for religious practice. 
Jesus transcends either or scenarios with deeper truths of the kingdom and an invitation to draw nearer to his love. So let's take a look at the passage and see how this plays out. I'll just read it again. Later, they sent some of the Pharisees and Herodians to Jesus to catch him in his words. And they came to him and said, teacher, we know that you're a man of integrity. You aren't swayed by others because you know you pay no attention to who they are, but you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? Should we pay or shouldn't we? But Jesus knew their hypocrisy. Why are you trying to trap me? He asked. Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. They brought the coin and he asked them, whose image is this and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. And then Jesus said to them, give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to God what is God's. And they were amazed at him. So most of you know that Matthew and I have three kids, two teenage sons and a younger daughter, which means we have direct access to the cultural wisdom of the next generation. <laughs> so as part of my preparation, I decided to pull my resident teenager on the way to school one morning um, to step outside of my own frame and hear from him on what might be a good sermon um, given this passage. So he read the passage aloud, and after the first verse said, you need to explain who the Herodians are. <laughs> they seem like randoms. <laughs> He's right. Um, Herodians, Herodians are randoms. They're only mentioned a couple of times in the scriptures, this being one of the passages. He kept reading. He came across the word denarius. He told me to be sure that I defined that word. Um, and then I had my own question from the text when I read it for the first time is, what is the imperial tax? So um, to give a helpful bit of context, I'm going to answer those three questions. Who are the Herodians? What is the denarius? What is the imperial tax? And why did it matter in that day? First, the Herodians, they were a political party among the Jews who were supporters of King Herod. Okay, so they're political. Um, they enjoyed the benefits that they received because of the Roman Empire. Now remember, Rome is oppressive, but at least it offers some sense of safety, some protection from, you know, other outside folks coming in and taking over. And there was at least some bit of prosperity. King Herod supported the Romans and sought to bring Roman culture to Israel. Their affiliation, the Herodians, their affiliation, a primarily political one, would have put them at odds with the Pharisees, who were primarily religious and concerned with Jewish law and faith. The fact that representatives from both of these groups have come together for this thing to try and trap Jesus is actually really surprising. Typically, they would have been on opposite sides of the fence. So that's the randoms, the Herodians. They're a political party of Jews who supported the presence of Rome in their land. Okay. Next, what's a denarius? A denarius is a Roman coin. It contained the image of the Caesar or, or the emperor, and it had writing on it that declared the emperor divine, first of all, and secondly, the high priest over all the people in the land. So it's an image of Caesar, and an inscription that said, Caesar is divine and he is the high priest. What's the imperial tax? And why did this question matter? The imperial tax was a special tax. I'm not a big fan of special taxes, so I'm already against this. Um, the imperial tax was a special tax that was imposed on the subjects of the Roman Empire who were not Roman. All right, so this is only for people who are not Roman citizens. All right, now you can imagine why are the Jews so frustrated about having to pay this tax? Jews in Judea were required to pay this tax every year. A couple of decades prior to this encounter in the temple, there was an uprising by a man named Judas of Galilee. He formed a group called the Zealots. 
he had led a revolt against Rome and against paying this imperial tax because he was under the conviction that God ruled over everything and they should have no other king and pay no taxes to any Caesar. It was a matter of conscience and faith. Judas of Galilee was quickly done away with by Rome, but the zealots, his group, continued to spread their message to the people of Judea, and as you might imagine, not paying taxes to an oppressive occupying empire was a popular one among the Jews. So, we have the political Herodians colluding with the religious Pharisees at the direction of the chief priests in Jerusalem. They have found the perfect scenario by which to rid themselves of Jesus. Ask him a political religious question and force him to take a side. If he answers that the people should pay the tax, then he becomes a religious traitor. He's discredited because essentially he's saying, yeah, pay the tax, acknowledge the divine nature of Caesar or acknowledge the fact that we are God's people ruled by another. He becomes a religious traitor. If he answers that the people should not pay the tax, he becomes a political rebel and is subject to arrest by Roman authority. Certainly, it's a trap that is being set for Jesus and he recognizes it and he names it as such. Rather than answering their question, he asks questions of his own and then subverts the whole scene with a stunning statement. His response is so good that the, the passage finishes with, and the people were amazed at him. I imagine them standing there with their mouths open with absolutely nothing to say. What amazes me about Jesus is his ability to cut through a misguided or ill-fated question and deliver an invitation that reorients the hearer or in our case, as readers and hearers. We are being reoriented. And still, we're 21st century Christians living in and around our nation's capital. And I guess we're all wondering this morning, does this passage have anything to do with me and my life and my everyday? How I live in this time and place? And I think so. But I'll tell you, it will disrupt some dichotomies it will invite us to reconsider our allegiances and our influences. And it will beckon us again to live in light of God's goodness and grace. So how does this passage disrupt our false dichotomies? As the religious and political leaders approach Jesus, like I said, they ask him this divisive religious political question. He dismantles the dichotomy without directly answering whether or not they should pay the tax. Paying the tax wasn't the point, though it also wasn't unimportant. Jesus exposed his pronouncement, give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to God's what is God's. And he dismantled that dichotomy. Here's how. So if you're gonna, if you're gonna understand what that means, you have to ask the question, well, what is Caesar's? And then you ask the question, what is God's? And then you ask the question, what is not God's, right? As Jews, Jesus' audience would have known that all things belong to God. God is the ultimate creator and all things belong to him. That's where the dichotomy begins to break down. It is not a Caesar versus God dichotomy. It's God as the orienting principle and Caesar in reference to God. So I'll admit, I had to give a little bit of thought to this this week because I tend to be a very linear thinker. I'm like, well, A plus B plus C, you know, and sequence things. I don't think it works that way. Um, so it just wasn't working for me. And so I, <laughs> I'll admit, I'm, I'm not an astronomer, but I thought this might be a helpful frame of reference for us. I think it's like our solar system, okay? So we have moons, we have comets, we have planets, we have, I guess, quite a lot of space trash out there, right? Um, all of that is in our solar system and those things all exist, but they exist in reference to one thing, that's the sun. 
everything orbits around and is oriented to the sun. So I thought, oh, that's more helpful because it's not this. It's this and everything else in reference to it. The sun is what holds everything together and all the other things revolve around it. All things orient around God and God is the one that holds them together. So going back to the question from the passage, what is God's? All of it is God's. In the text, Jesus is demonstrating his authority over the religious and political systems and structures. And in doing so, he just disrupts the whole dichotomy. What is Caesar's? Well, some things are Caesar's, but those things are in reference to and oriented around the truth that everything is God's. Is there a religious political dichotomy? No. Our political lives are lived in reference to our faith in God. We do live political lives. We should be engaged in the polis, in the, in the politic of the people, what is for the common good. But that is lived in reference to our allegiance to God. Another dichotomy that I've had to dismantle through the years is the sacred-secular dichotomy. Anyone with me? that there's this big division between the sacred and the secular. When I was a little girl, there were very clear lines drawn that uh, there were things that were Christian and there were things that were secular. Um, I have distinct memories of living as a little girl in my grandparents' house in East Moline on Ninth Street Court. We lived in the corner house. And I did Christian things like memorizing Bible verses. I went to Awanas. Anyone? Awanas is a, yeah, okay, great. Um, Christian Kids Club. I always thought, well, it's the alternative to brownies because we got to wear these little vests like the brownies got to wear vests. Anyway, so we played lots of fun competitive games at Awanas, but it was Christian because it was at church and I was memorizing Bible verses. Um, so, so there was the Awanas. Uh, what else did I do? Oh my gosh, I listened to lots of Christian music, um, and I was taught how to worship by a very whew, disturbing, odd, odd, Salty the Singing Songbook. Okay, okay, we got somebody. Um, blue songbook puppet creature thing um, that taught, yes, it was a Psalter, yes, and taught children that worshiping God was singing to God from your heart. And look it up on YouTube later or don't. Um, it'll be a whole experience. Yeah, beautiful. Um, those were the Christian things that I did. And I did other things during my days on Ninth Street Court, like go to Ridgewood Elementary School, play Star Wars in the ravine behind my grandparents' house with my friends Matt and Monica and my sisters. A few days a week, I would take gymnastics and I would go to dance class. Those things were decidedly not Christian somehow. If they were going to be Christian, it would be because I was evangelizing my friends. That would be Christian. I had my God world and I had the rest of my life. And it wasn't until later in life that I realized that dichotomy does not exist. We are not Christians because we come to church on Sunday morning and then something else the rest of the week. We are not Christians because we sing songs to God and because we memorize Bible verses or because we pray and read our Bible. We are Christians because we follow the ways of Jesus as best we can day in and day out. And we live in a world that is under the rule and reign of God. And that is not secular. It is all God's. Brief caveat here. I'm aware that a phrase like living under the rule and reign of God can be an unfavorable one maybe for some of us. Um, some of us bristle at the thought of there being a rule or ruler over us because of how broken and messed up authority has been in our lives. Because as Justin mentioned last week, leaders are sometimes abusive. Power often corrupts and it is hard to trust. Let's be honest, we're Americans. Independence is one of our most deep-seated values and we value it above most things. So a ruler and a reign? Nah. No, thank you. But 
I was reminded this week that we don't operate in a vacuum. We ought to not be naive about the forces that are actively shaping and influencing us. We are formed by ads, music, shows, social media, and sure, those things have varying degrees of influence on our lives, but they can and do shape how we view ourselves and how we view the world around us. Beyond the media, we're in relationships with people, with colleagues, with neighbors, with friends. Even those in our small groups and here on Sunday mornings have some influence on our lives. The truth is, we're always worshiping something. We're being formed by any number of things. We don't exist in a vacuum. And the overarching big story narrative of Jesus is an invitation to live under the generous, gracious, liberating, just, and completely loving rule and reign of God. In this passage, Jesus was breaking down the divides between the sacred and the secular, between spiritual, political, everything is God's. Here at Christ City, we, want, we say that we want the kingdom of God on display in every life and every sphere of life because it's all God's. Every life and every sphere of life. If we're going to really live, we have to dismantle those dichotomies, those divides between our worlds, and give back to God all that is God's. Because all of who we are belongs to God. But doing this can often be a challenge. There are so many things that vie for our allegiance and our attention. In the midst of the encounter with the Herodians and Pharisees, Jesus tells them to bring him a denarius. When they give it to him, he asks two simple questions. Whose image is this and whose inscription? I have two very similar questions that have nothing to do with a coin, but everything to do with our lives. First is, do you know whose image you bear? And the second is, where are God's words inscribed on your life? The Greek word used in the passage is the word icon, image. It's the same word that's used in the Greek translation of the Old Testament. In Genesis 1, when God said, let us make humankind in our own image, in our icon. For those of us who've been at Christ City for a while, we are fluent with the language of and theology around the fact that we are image bearers. Justin made reference to it a little bit ago. Familiarity and fluency in can be good, but sometimes the familiar comes with a bit of taking that thing for granted. Um, I'll, I'll tell you, I, I have a favorite movie. Um, my favorite movie, don't tease me, it's a great movie, is Good Will Hunting. Yeah, mm, a little chuckle, thank you. Um, I rewatched a scene of Good Will Hunting this week, and um, it's a scene where Will, who is a young man who's court mandated to be seeing a therapist because he is a victim of abuse and has lived a mess, um, as you might imagine, having been such a terrible victim of abuse. So he's court mandated to see a therapist. And he's in a session with his therapist, Sean. And Will has <laughs> really treated most of his therapists very poorly. Um, except Sean is a little different. And Sean confronts Will with a truth. And he asks him, or he tells him, after looking at his chart, after looking at the, the photos of the bruises on his ribs and the beaten nature that his foster dad had left him in, and he looked at Will and he said, you know, it's not your fault. And Will is like, yeah, yeah, I know. And the therapist continues, it's not your fault. And Will is like, yeah, I know. And he says, it's not your fault. I know. And Sean, the therapist, continues to say it over and over until Will feels the weight of the truth. 
and he's broke down by the weight of the truth and the presence of love that Sean is being in his life. And so I wanna ask us today, because it matters today, it matters every day, let's be honest, but on a day like today, it matters. Do you know whose image you bear? It can't be so familiar that you don't reckon with it. It can't be so familiar that we don't understand the weight of it. Do you know whose image you bear? In Spanish, we have the word ser, and it, it translates to being. It's both a noun and a verb. Um, if we know we are made in God's image in our ser, we know it in our being and in our doing. Do you know whose image you bear? You bear the image of the Almighty One, of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. You bear the image of love. You bear the image of justice. You bear the image of righteousness. You bear the image of beauty and glory. You bear the image of goodness. You bear the image of God. And that image not only speaks to your identity and your value, but also of your calling and your vocation. When we know it in our ser, it affects our being and it affects our doing. It is a noun and a verb. So we can be people who are reconcilers and do the work of reconciliation. We can be people who, like the good shepherd, walk with those who need accompaniment. Our God is the great healer, so we come alongside people and communities that are broken, and we live according to our image, and we help foster healing in those people and places. When we know we are image bearers in our said, we are aware of our identity, of our inherent value and worth, and in light of those things, we live into our calling and our vocation. Do you know whose image you bear. The second question and a very poignant and related one is, where are God's words inscribed in your life? Justin talked about narratives a little bit ago and there are far too many destructive narratives about who we are to not give significant attention to this question. In a week like this one that exposes the legacies of white supremacy that have again laid waste the bodies of Asians, Asian Americans, and African Americans in our country, it is good and right to expose the truth of our history that defined some people as partially human. That narrative allowed for generations of abuse, murder, genocide, internment, displacement, kidnapping, and countless other forms of hatred. Words matter. Narratives matter because they are defining. And we must reject the disordered, inhumane, twisted narratives of our day that would have us believe that we are anything less than image bearers of God. We are not merely objects for consumption or objects of pleasure. We are not defined by our bank accounts or our grades in school. We are not worthy or unworthy because of our age. We are not good because of our capacity to produce goods. We are not valued because of our abilities and invalued because of our disabilities. We are most certainly not better or worse because of the color of our skin or the zip code in which we were born. So let me ask the question again. Where are God's words inscribed on your life? Jesus is the one who is full of grace and truth. Jocelyn and Andrea just sang about that. Full of grace and truth. And what are those words that he has spoken to you about you? What inscription do you bear? 
Jesus asked some good questions. Another thing that I admire about Jesus, in addition to his good questions, is his way of avoiding traps, right? Um, he saw through the flattery of the Herodians and the Pharisees. He said, when they came to him, this was their, this was their whole buildup. Teacher, we know that you're a man of integrity. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are, but you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. All for show. Just trying to build Jesus up. Obviously, all of these things are true. He was a man of integrity. He wasn't primarily influenced by the opinion of, of others. And he taught the way of God truthfully. Still, Jesus knew these guys were there to try and catch him in his words, not to genuinely compliment him. There was a setup which was meant to be followed up by a takedown. But the takedown didn't happen. Jesus avoided it because he was aware of what was going on. He was aware of the trap that was being set for him. So my next question from this passage is, are we aware of the traps that get set for us? The kind of traps I'm talking about are the ones that distract or deter us from God's love and God's grace. What I notice in the passage is that Jesus wasn't dis di distracted or deterred by the agenda of the Pharisees and the Herodians. He didn't fall into their trap. He observed their flattery. He called out their hypocrisy. He asked them questions, and he responded somehow without impaling himself on the horns of their dilemma. Jesus kept his focus on God's love and the things that he was meant to do to demonstrate that love to us. If you and I are going to really live, then let's fashion our lives after these aspects of Jesus. Let's be aware of the traps that turn us inward on ourselves and away from the love and the grace of God. We don't have to continue to succumb to the habits of brokenness that trip us up time and time again. We can move away from things like envy and deceit and lust and greed. Our fear and worry can be relinquished so that we can more deeply take hold of joy and faith. What it all really boils down to is that we give to God what is God's? All the aspects of our lives belong to him. The sorrow, the joy, the anger, the peace, the disappointment, they all belong to God. The places of our lives that are healed and the places of our lives that have yet to be healed, those belong to God. The negative narratives of ourselves and others that we hate and still we hold, those belong to God. There is nothing that is not God's. There may be things that you're withholding. And the truth is, withholding never leads to life. There are probably parts of your life where you're keeping God at arm's length. And the invitation is the same to all of us. Give back to God what is God's. And so what will you choose today? Will you, will you choose to hold or will you choose to give back? That's the question. And for each and every one of us, there's going to be specific different things that we're invited to surrender. One thing I can say that I've learned over a lifetime of being loved by Jesus is that God's love is patient and it's kind and it's worth everything that you have to give.